My mom is awesome. She's 5'7", 71, and she was born in Panama. Came to this country in 1956, and once she showed me a document that was her sponsorship from her, uh, from at that time, her aunt, who said on this document that my mom and my grandmother would not be a burden to society and that they would be able to contribute to America because they had $300 and a typewriter and the will to give to this culture in our society. She worked very hard her whole life. She was, uh, she did, she had been a social worker after raising us and had two master's degrees and worked in emergency rooms. She worked with transplants and she worked with domestic violence victims. And for those that didn't survive, she worked with their families. She gave her life to help other people. And to say that she is my hero would be one of the greatest understatements. She has always been an inspiration to me. So one of the things that she always taught me was that one of the, there were two lessons. And, and one of them was that no matter how difficult a problem is, if we break that problem into small pieces, that we can resolve whatever that issue is. And when we're going through some of these long, difficult challenges, if we focus on the right here and now, we can get overwhelmed. And to remember that this too shall pass, no matter how difficult it seems we are in the midst of something, that it'll be okay. So I want to share a couple stories that illuminate how those lessons helped me, and hopefully they'll help you. The first story begins in 2005. And in 2005, um, a good friend of mine, Dragos, was uh, getting married. And my gift to him was a flight in a small airplane. And so I sat in the back seat while he flew with an instructor. And we flew around San Diego. And it was an incredible experience. Sitting in the back of that plane, looking out over the earth, and feeling this different perspective of being above everything. So we came back. And I told my mom that I was super excited. And she said, are you sure you want to become a pilot? Are you sure? They're kind of dangerous. And of course, you know, it's what we all hear on the news. Whenever there's a small plane crash, it's what's totally sensationalized. Never mind that we see car crashes on the, on the TV all the time, and that doesn't dissuade us from getting into our cars. But she asked me, are you sure? And I said, yes. And she said, well, you should go do that. So I did. I started learning to fly. And one of the first lessons that came to me that reminded me of that lesson that my mom shared with me early on was about, was, was about keeping safe. So when you fly, there are a lot of things that you have to be paying attention to. And there are sometimes things that can go wrong when you fly a small airplane. One of those is a spin. So a spin is a maneuver that, uh, if it's not performed properly, can be fatal. The idea is if a plane goes up, loses its ability to hold itself in the sky, and can spin down, and if you don't know how to get out of a spin, it usually doesn't end well. So I decided to tell my instructor, I want to learn how to spin this airplane, which he said, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I do. Just in case it happens, I want to be a safe pilot. So we decided, well, let's go get a small plane. So when you learn to fly, you rent planes. And there's a whole number of different planes you can rent from these flying clubs. And so we picked a Cessna 150, which is a very small plane that's got two seats. And uh, it's, it's really good for getting in and out of spins. So if you're going to try this, you want to make sure you do this in a plane that's going to have a good chance of getting out of it. So this Cessna 150, it was built in 1968 almost 40 years old at the time. And uh, you can imagine what a plane that's 40 years old is like. It's not quite as good as brand new. <laughs> Being a little over 40 myself, I can attest to that. So we take this plane and uh, we pull it out. So you have to, you take the tow bar and you attach it to the front wheel and you pull the plane out and we get in. And this is the first time I'd been in this little plane. And the floor was coming up a little bit. The dashboard didn't sit quite right. There were some holes from pieces that weren't there anymore. And uh, the doors didn't close quite right. And the, and the seat belt, 
is this tiny little lap belt and it's got a little rusty clasp on it. And as I sit down and I think, okay, well, this is, let's hope this goes well. <laughs> and Aaron, my flight instructor is sitting next to me and he says, yeah, don't worry. I've flown this plane before. It'll be fine. So we take off and uh, we head towards El Capitan Reservoir out in East San Diego County. And it's, it's definitely one of those warm summer days. And, and if you've ever been in a small plane near the, near the earth, when it's warm, there's a little bit of turbulence. So we're flying out, kind of getting bounced around a little bit, and we get over El Capitan Reservoir and we start to climb. So we climb up to 5,000 feet. And the way this works is the plane starts to climb and at a certain point, the engine just can't hold the plane up anymore. And just like when you're in, an, in a car, you get used to the sounds and the feeling of driving. The same thing happens when you fly. You get used to the sound of the engine, the sound of the wind blowing past the, the plane. And as you climb, you notice things are changing. So as, as, we li as we start to get closer to the top, it starts to get quieter. And I can hear the engine really starting to struggle because it can't hold us up anymore. And then it reaches that critical point at the very top and it starts to fall. At that very moment, as the, as the plane starts to fall, it falls towards my side. And the weight of Aaron's shoulder on mine and my weight against the door pops the door open. <laughs> so you can imagine a little bit of panic sets in. My instinct is as I'm looking down 5,000 feet and seeing this little rusty clasp holding me in place is to grab Aaron's leg, <laughs> something he'll never let me live down, and rightfully so. But in retrospect, as he did everything that he was supposed to do, push the nose forward, opposite rudder, the plane comes out of the spin, comes out of the dive, comes out, and we're just fine. But as I looked over at him, in the midst of all this chaos and panic happening in my brain, he was absolutely calm because he knew what had to be done. He had the training and he had the right mindset. He knew that you do one thing after another in the proper order and everything will be okay. And I realized that even in small things that happen very quickly like that, that my mom's lesson really applied. My next story begins in 1999. In 1999, I was playing hockey for my university and we were playing in a summer league with a couple of the guys I skated with. And there was a member of the opposing team who took exception, as sometimes happens in an ice hockey game, and wanted to fight me. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed and a fight did not actually break out. But as will happen in many male relationships, we became very close friends after. <laughs> so so we, we, we stayed friends for many years, and uh, he's an accountant. And at the time, I was at the very early stages. Well, that, soon after that, I moved to San Diego to start my business. And I was in the very early stages of running my business, and we had some ups and downs. And then in 2011, I asked if he would come by or move out from New Mexico and come to San Diego to help me start my business and help, help me manage the finances. I needed somebody that I could trust, somebody that could help me start the business and, and keep it going. And so he came out and helped me relaunch my business under the, its current brand. And we went through a lot of ups and downs. And in 2016, we were confronted with a very difficult challenge. We, had, uh, we were acquiring another company um, there was a lot of complicated paperwork involved. And so we were going through this change from one accounting firm to another. And the new accounting firm said, we really need to make sure that we audit all your books. And most of us have been through an audit to know that it's not a lot of fun to do that. So my friend was helping me go through that whole process. And we, um, at one point when we were dealing with the mountain of paperwork, he invited me into our war room, the office, and we sat down. And we were, we were going to go over the latest issue of the day. And as I walked in and I sat down, I looked at him and something was wrong. And I didn't know what it was, but I could tell something was deeply disturbing him. And it was at that moment that I could tell that something big was going to happen. One of those moments that we remember. And it was at that moment when I looked at him and he said, Lars, I have something to tell you. 
I've been taking money from the company. So you can imagine the difficulty that that, that that creates. I felt like someone had stabbed me in the heart. It was very difficult at that moment. I was overwhelmed with emotion, sadness, betrayal. But a calm came over me when I remembered what my mom taught me. In spite of all of that overwhelming feeling, I knew that if I solved this problem one step at a time, that I would be okay. So I did. I asked him to leave, found a forensic accountant, hired another accountant, rebalanced the books, everything was fine. He paid back what he took and we've moved on. But in the midst of all of that, because it was a six month process, there were those times when I felt that I was never going to get through it, that I was emotionally so distraught, the chaos that it left behind was going to beat us. But then I thought back to what my mom taught me, what she always said, that no matter how difficult the problem is, we will overcome it. So back, sitting next to my mom, I'm sitting on the bed next to her, my sisters are with me, and I look to her, and I know that these are the last breaths of her life. And as I hold her hand, I don't know if she knows that I'm there. She'd been diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. The doctors gave her six months to live, and is often the case with people who are diagnosed with terminal illness, they overestimate the amount of time that somebody has left. It had been six weeks. And she was in my home. I was fortunate enough that I could take care of her and nurse her through her transition through the end of her life. I had the support of friends and family and everyone was there. But as I sat and I look at her and I see who she is, I see the inspiration, I see the, the lessons that she shared with me. I remember that these lessons that I remember, the stories that she tells me are how I continue her legacy. We all have people in our lives who have given us stories, who have shared lessons with us and how we take those lessons and stories and share them with others is how we create a legacy for those who have left us. This community is built on the history of those who have loved us and cared for us. I encourage you to take some time today and think about the stories and lessons that have been given to you from those who have left your life and carry their legacy forward and make your future and everyone else's future brighter.